thank you for buying our videotape on defense and counterattack. We have tried to make this tape as informative as possible. It's easily the equivalent of hundreds of dollars worth of Grandmaster chess lessons. Because the material is so condensed and moves rapidly, please utilize the benefit of video. Rewind and review any parts of the tape you don't understand. Here are some suggestions to receive the full benefit of the instructive material on this tape. First, when Grandmaster Wolf presents you with a list of candidate moves or asks you to stop and analyze the position, please stop the tape and do the analysis as best you can without moving the pieces on your chessboard. This will do two things. It will help you improve your analysis skills and also enhance your ability to visualize attacks. If you don't understand the reasons for the moves played, please rewind the tape and go over the variation again. Some of the variations on this tape are quite complex and you may have to go over them several times. Remember, if you want to play like a master, you must understand like a master. Other videos available from Right Angle include Grandmaster Edmar Mednis, King and Pawn Endgames, Rook and Pawn Endgames, and middle game analysis. From Grandmaster Patrick Wolf, how to play winning attacks and defense and counterattack. And from I am Danny Kopeck, a brilliant tape on how to visualize chess combinations. So good luck and good chess. Hi, I'm Grandmaster Patrick Wolf. Thank you for buying this video, Defense and Counterattack. In this video, we will be discussing the successful defense. Now, there are two separate meanings that we can have for defense. The first is the idea of defense as protection of weakness. In the companion video to this one, Winning Attacks, I define an attack as the attempt to exploit a weakness. It follows, therefore, that defense is the attempt to protect or to repair a weakness. It's important for you to understand that by this definition of defense, one does not necessarily have to have a bad game in order to have to defend. Indeed, you may very well have equal or better chances. It will simply be necessary to defend accurately against your opponent's threats in order to realize the potential of your position. On the other hand, defense can also mean playing a bad position to the best of your ability. In this kind of defense, you do have a difficult game. However, this is not a reason to despair. Even bad positions can be played well, 
And we will see several examples of bad positions which were drawn or even won because of good play on the part of the defender. Now, I would like to take this moment to stress something that is very important. It is a myth that most chess games are won by brilliant play on the part of the winner. This is the impression we get because, after all, only the best games by grandmasters are published, and only our best games are the ones that we like to brag about to our friends. In fact, though, if you think about it, most chess games, even those of grandmasters, are lost, not won. Most of the time, a game is decided because of a mistake rather than because of a brilliant move. And many games need to have several mistakes made before the cause is hopeless. This video is about the skill of handling critical decisions well. And when you have made a mistake, it is also about hanging tough so that you can turn the tide. We will divide this video into two parts. First, we will discuss defense as the protection of weakness, both in general and in particular as concerns the king. In the latter part of this tape, we will move on to discuss defending a difficult position and how you can turn the tables. Defense as the protection of weakness. Part one, correcting or compensating for strategic deficiency. Lotier Kamsky, Lonares, 1994. 1, d4, knight f6, 2, c4, g6, 3, knight c3, d5, 4, c takes d5, knight takes d5, 5, e4, knight takes c3, 6, b takes c3, bishop g7, 7, knight f3, castles kingside, 8, bishop e2, c5, 9. Rook b1, b6. 10. Castles kingside, queen c7. Grandmaster Kamsky has played the Grunfeld defense, and Grandmaster Lotier has responded very aggressively, building up a very powerful center. Black's last move is somewhat unusual. Usually, black takes more direct action against white's center, particularly the vulnerable d4 point. Black is usually quite worried that if he fails to act quickly, white's center will choke him. 11. Bishop e3. Bishop b7. 12. Bishop d3. Knight d7. 13. Queen d2. Rook a d8. 14. Bishop g5. Queen d6. At this point, you may want to pause your VCR and try to determine what white's best move would be. Keep in mind that this is a strategic position and not a tactical one. If you have not already done so, please consider the following moves. First, 15 e5. Next, 15 d5. And finally, 15 rook b d1. First, 15 e5. This would be a mistake. It's true that white defends the vulnerable d4 pawn against immediate capture. But in so doing, white also opens up the long diagonal for the black bishop on b7. Most importantly, white fixes his own d pawn as a permanent weakness. He gives black the d5 square for either his queen or his bishop. And he allows black, by the maneuver knight on d7 to b8 to c6, to attack the white d-pawn. It's true that the white e-pawn does block the black bishop on g7, and under different circumstances this might prove useful for white. But here, the weakness of the white d-pawn is the most important feature of the position. Next, 15 d5. This, I believe, would be the correct move, and would give white a slight advantage. It's true that white does open up the long diagonal for the black bishop on g7, but there will be no targets for this bishop once white plays the next move, which would be c3 to c4. In, in addition, the pawn on d5 would be quite strong, restricting the black bishop on b7, and generally gaining white a territorial advantage in the center. Black would not have too bad a game, but white would have a space advantage and slightly the better prospects. Finally, 15 rook bd1. This is the move that Lotte played in the game. I don't think it's the best move, but it is quite a reasonable move, bringing the rook closer to the center. 
Kamsky now, aware of the danger of being cramped by White's center, reacted very well to give his pieces scope. You may want to pause the VCR here and consider how you would play Black's position. Kamsky played 15, c takes d4, 16, c takes d4, rook c8. By these last two moves, Black has activated his rook along the c-file. In addition, he gains a critical square for his queen on the white queen side. The game continued, 17, queen e2, h6, 18, bishop e3, queen a3. This is the square on the queen side that I was talking about. 19, h4, e6, 20, knight d2, knight f6, 21, knight c4, queen e7, 22, f3, rook c7, 23, g4, rook d8, 24, queen f2. White has redeployed his pieces usefully to cover the queen side and looks to be attacking Black's king. Black, however, has fixed White's d-pawn on d4 as a permanent target and has kept all of his pieces quite active. The game looks approximately even, but by employing the proper defensive techniques, Black quickly gains the upper hand. How would you now play for Black? Again, at this point, you may want to pause the VCR, and while you consider the position, Please bear in mind that when you are cramped, a very good technique is to trade pieces. The game continued. 24, bishop a6. 25, knight e5. Bishop takes d3. 26, rook takes d3. White's last recapture was probably a mistake. He should have done better to take with the knight with an equal position. Black now continued trading and further exposed the weakness of the white d-pawn by playing 26, knight d7. 27, knight takes d7. Notice that white could not defend the knight on e5 because of the pin on the d3 rook, so that this capture is forced. 27, queen takes d7. Now look what proper defensive technique has wrought black in the last few moves. There is no longer a threat to his king, while white is left with a weak d-pawn and a weak queen side. Black was able to quickly organize tremendous pressure against white's weak pawn. 28, rook f d1, queen a4. Again, notice how well black deploys his queen on the queen side. 29, rook 1 d2, rook c d7. 30, d5. Kamsky tries to trade his weak pawn, but he has overlooked a tactic. 30, e takes d5. 31, e takes d5. Rook d6. 32, queen f1. Queen a5. 33, queen d1. Black can now win the d-pawn by force. Do you see how? Pause the VCR at this point to search for the correct move for black. Black played 33, bishop c3. White cannot save the pawn by 34, rook c2. Rook takes d5. 35, rook c takes c3. Queen takes c3. 36, rook takes d5 because of 36, Queen takes e3 check. And also, on the last move, please notice that if 36 rook takes queen on c3, black takes the queen by 36 rook takes d1 check with a winning material advantage. Therefore, returning to our original position, after black played 33 bishop c3, white therefore played 34 bishop f4, rook 6 d7, 35 rook c2, rook takes d5, and now again notice that 36 rook c takes c3 does not work. This time black has a very different tactic at his disposal. 36 queen takes c3, 37 rook takes d5, and now the extremely clever queen c5 check. 
38 rook takes c5, rook takes d1 check, 39 king f2, b takes c5. Therefore, returning to our original position, white therefore played 36 rook takes d5, but now, down a pawn, he quickly lost. Kamsky took the rook on d5, 37 queen e2, king h7, 38 king g2, bishop e5, 39 queen e4, bishop takes f4, 40 queen takes f4, king g7, 41 king h3, g5, 42 queen e4, queen b5, 43 h takes g5, h takes g5, 44 a4, queen d7, 45 rook c7, queen d6, okay. 46 queen c2, and now rook d2, and white resigned, because after 47 queen c3 check, king g6, White will have to give up his queen to avoid immediate checkmate on h2. Let's now look at another example of a player using excellent defensive technique to handle a similar strategic deficiency in his position. This is the game Lotier Karpov, Linares, 1994. 1. c4, e5. 2. Knight c3, knight f6. 3, knight f3, knight c6, 4, g3, bishop b4, 5, knight d5, bishop c5, 6, bishop g2, d6, 7, castles kingside, castles kingside, 8, e3, bishop g4, 9, h3, bishop h5, 10, d3, a5, 11, a3, bishop a7, 12, knight c3, rook e8, 13, queen c2. We have reached the beginning of the early middle game. What should each side's plan be? Pause the VCR and consider this position before hearing my evaluation. White's plan is simple. Playing rook b1, b4, b5, and gaining space on the queen side. Black has no immediate prospects on the king side, so he must look for counterplay in the center. The normal move, therefore, and the one I believe most grandmasters would have first considered, is 13 d5. The ex-world champion found another extraordinary plan, also designed to secure central counterplay, but without creating the weaknesses that 13 d5 incurs. I'm not sure whether it is better than the normal move, but it is certainly extremely instructive for its skill in utilizing defensive techniques. Karpov played the move 13, knight d7. 14, rook b1, knight e7. Black has accomplished two things with these moves. First, the redeployment of the queen's knight allows black to play c6, as well as taking the sting out of white's intended b4, b5. And second, the redeployment of the king's knight protects the e5 square in preparation for c6, followed by d5. White continued with his plan with 15, b4, a takes b4, 16, a takes b4, c6, 17, queen b3, bishop g6, 18, rook d1, h6. Black's 17th and 18th moves are excellent, redeploying the bishop to a useful diagonal with tempo and then preserving it by clearing the h7 square. White continued 19 knight h4, bishop h7, 20 knight e4, bishop b8, 21 bishop a3, knight f8. Black continues to go backwards, but he is not given ground because he is poised to play d6, d5, which will push back white's pieces. Notice how black has eliminated all his weaknesses. He has only one weak square, that on d6, which he has amply protected with his pieces. White continued with his plan 
by 22 b5, knight e6, 23 rook a1, queen d7, 24 knight c3, bishop c7, 25 d4, e takes d4, 26 e takes d4. It looks at first as though Karpov has played too passively, but in his next few moves, his pieces will jump out to gain significant counterplay. Pause the VCR at this point to consider how you would play this position for black. Pay particular attention to white's king side and to the center. Karpov played two excellent moves. 26 knight g5, attacking the h3 pawn. So white played 27 king h2, and now bishop a5. Notice that while white has more space, black's position is more compact and has fewer weaknesses. By his last move, bishop a5, black is fighting for the e4 square. At the same time, his pieces are very well placed for counterplay against white's king. The danger of having less space is that your pieces will be passive, but Karpov has secured excellent activity for his pieces in this case, and notice that the corresponding danger of having more space is that if your opponent's pieces do get active, you have more weak squares. White played 28, bishop b2, bishop takes c3, 29, bishop takes c3, bishop e4. <coughs> Again, black's last two moves show excellent positional judgment. Notice the weakness of the h3 square. White's reply is forced. 30, f3. Bishop h7. At this point, I believe that white made a strategic mistake. I believe that it was necessary for white to open the diagonal of his dark squared bishop by playing 31 d5. Instead, Grandmaster Lotier allowed Karpov to achieve the central break which he began planning 20 moves ago. 31 rook takes a8, rook takes a8, 32 rook e1, d5. <coughs> Black is now better. White is weak on both the queen side and the king side. Again, this illustrates one of the advantages in defending a position with less space. If your opponent loses the grip which has restricted your pieces, then he will have lots of weaknesses for your active pieces to attack. Karpov's exploitation of this advantage, with some help from his opponent, was exemplary. 33, b takes c6, b takes c6, 34, bishop b4, d takes c4. Notice that black, attacking the queen with tempo, clears the important d5 square for his knight. 35, queen takes c4, knight d5, 36, f4, knight e6, 37, bishop d2, rook e8. 38 knight f3, f6. Notice that black's pawns and his light square bishop coordinate beautifully. The e5 square can be controlled by the f6 pawn, which keeps white's knight on f3 very passive. Contrast this with white's dark squared bishop on d2, which is terribly hemmed in by his own pawns. 39, rook c1. Bishop e4. An excellent move defending the c-pawn indirectly, which Grandmaster Lotier, in time pressure, may have overlooked. 40, queen takes c6, queen takes c6, 41, rook takes c6, knight d takes f4. Black's knight moves away, and black's bishop on e4 discovers an attack on the white rook. 42, rook d6, knight takes g2. White will now be terribly weak, on the light squares, particularly along the diagonal of the e4 bishop to the white king on g2. 43, king takes g2. Knight c7. 44, king f2. Rook a8. 45, bishop e3. Knight b5. 46, rook b6. Knight c3. 47, rook b3. Karpov has improved his position to the point where he now has the forced win of material. Do you see how? 
Pause your VCR at this point and analyze this position until you find Black's winning continuation. Karpov played 47, knight d1 check. White must move the king. If he moves it anywhere other than e2 or g2, Black will win the knight on f3. If you have not already considered this position, please analyze how Black would win material after either 48 king g2 or 48 king e2. First, 48 king g2, rook a2 check. This wins the knight on f3. Notice that if white plays 49 bishop d2, black can play 49 rook takes d2 check as the knight on f3 is pinned against the king. Next, 48 king e2. This was the game continuation. Black now has two winning moves. Black may play 48 bishop c2, 49 rook b7, rook e8, which wins because the white bishop on e3 is pinned to the king and cannot be defended. Turning to the original position, Karpov chose to play instead 48 bishop d5, which also wins. If white now plays 49 rook b5, then 49 knight takes e3, notice that the knight on e3 defends the bishop on d5, 50 king takes e3, rook a3 check, wins the knight on f3. Lotier, therefore, after bishop d5, played 49 rook d3, but he resigned after Karpov played 49 bishop c4. He must lose the exchange and enter a hopeless endgame. Our last two examples have considered the problem of defending a position where you have a spatial disadvantage. Now let's consider a position, again taken from a game by ex-world champion Anatoly Karpov, where the situation is even more dramatic. Not only is there a spatial disadvantage, but in addition, Black's king is in serious danger of being checkmated. Gelfand Karpov, Linares, 1994. Black to move after White's 23rd move. Once again, White has more space, but here we have the special feature of the hanging pawns. The white pawns on d4 and c4 control many central squares, but at the same time they are themselves not protected by other pawns. In other words, they give the impression of hanging in thin air. These pawns can be very powerful, but they can also be weak. It is clear that white has posted his pieces on very menacing squares. This is a critical position for black. He must organize some counterplay before white organizes very serious threats against his king. You are black. How would you play? Pause the VCR at this point before I continue with my examination of this position. Karpov played 23 b5. This is an extremely strong move which expertly exposes the weaknesses in White's position. Now the position is very complicated. I strongly recommend that you subject this position to a detailed analysis on your own. You will learn a lot from this analysis. I can tell you that I believe that black has equal chances in all cases. At least, that is what my preliminary analysis has told me. Perhaps you can probe more deeply and find possibilities that are hidden in the position. At any rate, there is no doubt that 23b5 is an excellent move which gives black good counterplay. We will examine four moves for white. 24d5, 24c takes b5, 24f5, and finally 24 bishop takes g6. First let's take a look at 24d5. The idea of this move is to induce black to block the d5 square with a pawn so that after 24e takes d5, white could play 25c takes b5. But Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan, commenting upon this game, points out that black could play the stronger move 24 queen b6, setting up a very strong pin which gives black the advantage. For example, if 25 rook c3 to defend the attacked rook on e3, then after 25 knight takes d5, 
26, c takes d5, rook takes c3, black has one material. Another possibility, which Grandmaster Serwan gives, is 25, queen e2, but now he notes that e takes d5 would be very strong. Notice that now the c4 pawn is pinned. It can't capture the pawn on b5 because the rook on c1 is unprotected. Let's look at the next possibility now. 24, c takes b5. This gives black a choice between two moves which are both very good. One possibility is to play 24, rook takes c1, 25, queen takes c1, queen takes d4. Black has established material equality, and his pieces have become very active. In particular, white's rook on e3 is in a very precarious position. Another possibility is to play immediately 24, queen d5. This simultaneously attacks the pawns on g2 and b5, giving black very good prospects. Now let's take a look at the third possibility, 24, f5. This is the move that I believe was the best. We will analyze two moves for black now. First, 24, knight takes e5. And next, 24, e takes f5. First, 24, knight takes e5. 25, d takes e5. Queen takes d1, check. 26, rook takes d1. Now the black knight on f6 is attacked, and so he must move it away with tempo. 26, knight g4. 27, rook g3. Rook takes c4. 28, h3. Black has one upon, but he has difficulties with his knight. White stands quite well, I believe. Let me give one sample line. If 28, knight takes e5, 29, bishop f6, attacking the knight on e5 and the g7 pawn simultaneously. The only way to defend both is to play knight g6. Now, 30, f takes g6, g takes f6, 31, g takes f7 check, king h8. I believe you will find that either king f8 or king takes f7 were inferior. 32, rook d7, rook c1 check, 33, king h2. Now I believe white stands quite well, and for example, if black greedily tries to take all the material he can with bishop takes g2, 34, rook takes g2, rook takes b1, so that black figures he has won material, in fact he loses the game after 35, rook e7, rook f8, 36, rook e8, and white wins. This line was not all forced, but I believe that it does represent the difficulties that black faces in this variation. This leaves our second possibility. 24, e takes f5, 25, bishop takes f5, rook c7. This is a dynamic, unbalanced position, which is quite unclear. Further investigation would be needed to determine with whom the better chances lie. Before we consider White's fourth option, the move played in the game, I would like to talk a moment about the spirit of defense. Suppose it turns out that White could, in fact, have gained the advantage in this or some other way after a 23b5. Does that mean that we should condemn the move? No. A good move is good, even if there lies some deeply hidden way for one side to solve all of the problems that it creates. Chess, after all, is first and foremost a struggle. Good defense is possible only by deciding that we must make the most of our chances in any position. Remember that most chess games are lost and not won. It is your responsibility to do everything possible to induce your opponent to lose. Karpov's move, 23b5, is just such a move. Besides, this is an excellent move on positional grounds. Black, after all, is attempting to improve his position and setting white difficult problems. What more could one possibly ask of a move in such a difficult position? The game continuation was 24, bishop takes g6, h takes g6, 25, rook h3. Now be careful. Remember you're playing black. What is white's threat? Pause the VCR until you are ready to hear my answer. 
White threatens 26, rook h8 check. King takes h8, 27, knight takes f7 check. Winning queen and pawn for rook and knight. Good defense means eternal vigilance. Returning to the game, black played 25, rook c7. The rook on c7 defends the f7 pawn, meeting the threat. 26, d5. E takes d5, 27, c5. White has chosen to sacrifice a pawn for nebulous compensation to keep some vestige of the initiative. Good defenders love to see such decisions. Karpov now plays a precise sequence of moves to take the initiative and keep the pawn. 27, bishop c8. Attacking the rook on h3 and moving the bishop to a more active diagonal. 28, rook b3. Queen e8. Simultaneously defending the pawn on b5 and moving out of the pin of the knight on f6. 29, queen d4. Bishop f5. 30, rook e3. Queen f8. 31, bishop takes f6. G takes f6. 32, knight f3. Bishop e4. Notice that the f-pawn is indirectly defended because black is attacking the c-pawn twice with his rook and queen. White played 33, knight d2, and now f5. Black has secured the initiative and stands much better with his extra pawn. I will give the rest of the game without comment as the game no longer concerns defensive technique, but Karpov's technique for winning a one position is always worthy of close study, and this game is an exemplary case in point. 34, rook c3, a5, 35, c6, queen b4, 36, knight b3, queen d6, 37, queen f2, b4, 38, rook c5, a4. Notice how black has pushed his queenside pawns forward. Black's extra pawn lies on the queenside, and he gets his pawns up so that he will be able to use it. 39, knight d4, bishop d3. This is a superb redeployment of the black bishop. It will cut the communication of the white rooks, and meanwhile defends the very important b5 square. 40, queen d2, bishop c4. 41, queen takes b4, queen takes f4. 42, queen c3, rook e8. 43, rook d1, rook e3. 44, queen c1, queen e4. 45, queen a1, rook c8. 46, rook a5. Rook a3, 47, queen b1, queen e3 check, 48, king h1, rook takes a2, 49, knight f3, bishop b3, 50, queen c1, f4, 51, rook e1, rook c2, 52, queen a1, queen b6, White resigned. The most dramatic moment in a chess game is often when one side decides to sacrifice a piece or other such heavy material. What should you do? The initial reaction is often to panic, but there's no reason to do so. After all, a sacrifice is a move, just like any other. You have basically two possible responses to a piece sacrifice. You may decide to accept it, or you may decide to decline it. Let's take a look first at declining the sacrifice. Now, there is a lot to be said for declining the sacrifice that your opponent makes. For one thing, your opponent will often assume that the piece must be taken. He may be caught off guard by the possibility that you would decline to accept his gift. Indeed, he may have overlooked some of the promising moves you have, which do not involve taking the sacrifice material. We will consider some famous examples from games played many years ago. But let's first take a look at an example from the Linares 1994 tournament. Polgar Kramnik, Linares 1994. 1, e4, c5. 2, knight f3, knight c6. 
3, d4, c takes d4, 4, knight takes d4, knight f6, 5, knight c3, d6, 6, bishop g5, e6, 7, queen d2, bishop e7, 8, castles queenside, castles kingside, 9, f4, knight takes d4, 10, queen takes d4, queen a5, 11, bishop c4, bishop d7, 12, e5, d takes e5, 13, f takes e5, bishop c6. This is a very standard position in opening theory. Notice that the knight on f6 is indirectly protected by the queen on a5. For example, if 14 e takes f6, queen takes g5 check, wins back the piece, and wins the pawn on f6. The standard continuation in this position is for white to play 14 bishop d2, knight d7, 15 knight d5, discovering the attack on the queen, queen d8, 16 knight takes e7 check, queen takes e7. This is a very imbalanced position, white having the advantage of more space and the two bishops, but black having a very compact position and better pawn structure. The young grandmaster, Jude Polgar, decided to try another move in this position. 14, bishop takes f6, g takes f6. Now, now if 15, e takes f6, then queen g5 check, wins the pawn back on f6, and gives black the advantage of the two bishops. So Grandmaster Polgar tried a new move which sacrifices a piece. She played the stunning 15 bishop d5. Should black accept or decline this sacrifice? And if he should decline it, what is the best move? Pause the VCR at this point and analyze this position until you are ready to hear my answers. Keep in mind that this is a very complicated position, so don't worry if you don't find everything. If you have not already done so, Please consider the following moves. 15, e takes d5. 15, bishop takes d5. 15, f takes e5. And 15, f5. Okay. 15, e takes d5. This immediate acceptance of the bishop is fatal. After 16, e takes f6, White threatens both the bishop on e7 and checkmate by queen g4 check. Black must play 16, bishop takes f6, 17, queen takes f6. When material is equal, black has a fatally weakened kingside, and to boot, his pawn on d5 will probably go lost. Next, 15, bishop takes d5. This other capture of the bishop is also terrible for the exact same reason. After 16, e takes f6, bishop takes f6, 17, queen takes f6, white has a tremendous advantage due to black's weakened kingside and exposed bishop on d5. Black would be forced to play 17, queen d8, when at the very least, 18, knight takes d5, e takes d5, 19, queen e5, wins a pawn. 15, f takes e5. As Kremnik himself pointed out after the game, this is quite bad for black. After 16, queen takes e5. Black cannot win a piece by taking on d5 because of the pin against the bishop on e7, while at the same time, white threatens to bring his rook up into the attack by rook d3, threatening a devastating check on g3. Finally, we look at black's best move and the move that Kramnik played in the game, 15 f5. This is the correct move. Black controls the vital g4 and e4 squares and maintains the threat against the bishop while eliminating the deadly possibility of e takes f6. It may appear at first that the black king is exposed to attack because of the doubled f pawns, half open g file. However, in fact the dark squared bishop becomes such a powerhouse that it simply doesn't matter. Notice that the fact that black controls the e4 and d5 squares with his pawns is very important because this makes the f6 square basically unexploitable as white cannot move a knight to give check on that square. 
After this critical defensive decision, black quickly gained the upper hand. White played 16, bishop takes c6, b takes c6. Now white tried to continue her attack by 17, g4, but several precise moves by Grandmaster Kramnik gave him the advantage. 17, bishop g5 check, 18, king b1, rook a d8. Notice that now the white queen has no square to go to where it will continue to defend the pawn on e5. So she played 19, queen c4, rook takes d1 check, 20, rook takes d1, queen takes e5, 21, g takes f5. Black now has the advantage because of his strong bishop against white's knight. In the game, Grandmaster Kramnik recaptured on f5 with the pawn, However, as he himself said, he should have captured with the queen, giving him a clear advantage. At, at any rate, after capturing with the pawn, he won a long endgame. Young Judith Polgar was only prepared for the attack she thought she was going to get against Kramnik's king. Kramnik's alert decision allowed him to maintain his king's safety and use his other advantages to gain the upper hand. One of the most famous examples of a declined sacrifice is the next game we will consider. It's interesting to note the circumstances of this game. It was played in the 1953 Candidates Tournament in Zurich, Switzerland. The winner of this tournament would play Budvinik for the World Championship title. Late in the tournament, Grandmaster Vasily Smyslov was in the lead. Grandmaster Paul Karash was half a point behind. In addition, Smyslov had already had his appointed rest day, while Karash would have his rest day after this game. It was therefore imperative for Grandmaster Karaj to win, and he launched a terrific attack to try to do so. Karaj Smyslov, Zurich, 1953. 1. C4. Knight F6. 2. Knight C3. E6. 3. Knight F3. C5. 4. E3. Bishop E7. 5. B3. Castles kingside. 6. Bishop b2. b6. 7. d4. c takes d4. 8. e takes d4. d5. 9. Bishop d3. Knight c6. 10. Castles kingside. Bishop b7. 11. Rook c1. Rook c8. 12. Rook e1. Knight b4. 13. Bishop f1, knight e4, 14, a3, knight takes c3, 15, rook takes c3, knight c6, 16, knight e5, knight takes e5, 17, rook takes e5, bishop f6, 18, rook h5. What, what is white's threat? You may want to pause the VCR until you are ready to hear my answer. Grandmaster David Bronstein, in his excellent book on the tournament, points out that white threatened to play 19, rook takes h7, king takes h7, 20, queen h5 check, king g8, 21, rook h3, bishop h4, 22, rook takes h4, f5, 23, queen h7 check, with a very strong attack with a small material investment of a rook for bishop and pawn. Returning to the original position, Grandmaster Smyslov met this threat by playing 18 g6. No doubt he anticipated that white would withdraw the rook from attack. Instead, however, Grandmaster Karaj played the absolutely startling 19 rook c h3. You are now black. You must decide whether to take the rook or not. Do you do so? What move would you play? Pause the VCR and analyze this position carefully until you are ready to hear my answers. <coughs> if you have not already done so, please consider the following two moves. 19, g takes h5, and 19, d takes c4. First, let's look at what happens if black captures the rook. 19, g takes h5. Grandmaster Smyslov is quoted as having said afterwards, I thought for a long time, I wanted very much to take the rook, the more so because I did not see how white could win. 
It turns out, however, that the attack is very strong if Black accepts the rook. Grandmaster Brunstein gives the following variations. 20, queen takes h5, threatening mate by queen takes h7, so rook e8. And now, the very subtle 21, a4. This tricky move threatens to bring the bishop into the attack via the a3 square. It is by no means certain that the attack is decisive, but it is clear that it is very strong and Grandmaster Bronstein offers the following variations as a demonstration of the dangers to black. First, 21 d takes c4, queen takes h7 check, king f8, bishop a3 check, rook e7, rook g3, king e8, rook g8 check, king d7, rook takes d8 check, Rook takes d8, bishop takes e7, king takes e7, bishop takes e4, with a decisive advantage. Next, suppose black plays instead queen d6. Now white has the very interesting move c5. And again, it does seem that white's attack is very strong. Grandmaster Bronstein gives three examples. First, if 22 b takes c5, 23 queen h6, attacking the bishop on f6, bishop g7, queen takes h7 check, king f8, and now 25 d takes c5. White uncovers the attack on the bishop on g7, while at the same time attacking the queen on d6. Go going back to the position after c5, if black plays queen d8, Grandmaster Bronstein gives the startling move c6, opening the diagonal with tempo as white attacks the bishop on b7, rook takes c6, bishop a3, threatening checkmate, rook d6, queen h6, bishop takes d4, bishop d3, and white's attack is very much unstoppable. Going back again, finally after c5, Grandmaster Bronstein gives a third possibility. If queen f4, 23, queen takes h7 check, king f8, 24, bishop a3, threatening a devastating discovered check by c6, b takes c5, 25, bishop takes c5 check, rook e7, 26, rook g3, threatening checkmate on g8, king e8, 27, bishop b5 check, with a very strong attack. Now these variations may not be completely conclusive. I'm sure that there was more analysis that could be done. However, the verdict is clear that black would have had to face an extremely strong attack had he taken the rook on h5. Bl Returning now to the critical position, let's look at the second move, the move that Grandmaster Smyslov played. 19, d takes c4. This is the correct move. And now I would like to quote from Grandmaster Bronstein's explanation of how Smyslov reached this decision. Grandmaster Bronstein writes, Smyslov's intuition did not let him down, and he played the best move, as was shown by subsequent analysis. But how did he make up his mind? If one may put it this way, what was the way that his intuition worked? Did he weigh it up carefully, or did he just toss a coin, as it were? Obviously, the move must have been the product of deep study of the position. Firstly, black opens the diagonal of his queen bishop, which can now be transferred to e4 and then g6. He also opens up the queen file and gets the chance to put his queen on d5, threatening mate, or even just to take the d-pawn. Thirdly, he gets just for the moment a passed pawn on the c-file, which can advance to c3 so as to block the dangerous long black diagonal. Meanwhile, the rook is left on prise and could be safely captured. For example, in the variation, if 20 b takes c4, then simply g takes h5, 21 queen takes h5, bishop e4. To this, I would like to add that it is so often true that an attack on the flank is best met by a counter strike in the center. After black played d takes c4, white played 20, rook takes h7. 
This is a natural decision by White to continue the attack, but it now seems that White is lost. Grandmaster Bronstein suggests that White could have drawn by playing instead Queen g4, c3, 21, bishop takes c3, rook takes c3, 22, rook takes c3, queen takes d4, 23, queen takes d4, bishop takes d4, 24, rook c7, g takes h5, 25, rook takes b7. Of course, this just leads to an equal endgame, or one which is only slightly worse for white, and Grandmaster Karaj, needing desperately to win this game, could not possibly have gone in for such a variation. Going back to the game, after white played 20, rook takes h7, black played c3. White now played 21, queen c1. White is displaying tremendous ingenuity in setting up a last trap. White had no better move. For example, if instead of queen c1, we look at first bishop takes c3, then simply rook takes c3, rook takes c3, king takes rook on h7. Black is up a piece for nothing. Next, if instead white simply moved the attack bishop by playing bishop c1, black could play queen takes d4 with a decisive advantage. Now, after white plays queen c1, you are now black. What do you play? Analyze this position carefully and pause the VCR until you're ready to hear my answers. If you have not already done so, please consider the following moves. 21, c takes b2. 21, bishop g5. And 21, queen takes d4. First, 21, c takes b2. This is hasty. You have overlooked white's threat. White now plays 22, queen h6. White threatens checkmate on h8, but he also has another threat. Black cannot defend against both these threats, because if black now plays 22, queen takes d4, white plays rook h8 check, bishop takes h8, queen h7, checkmate. Next, suppose black plays 21, bishop g5. You have stopped the threat of queen h6, but the bishop was necessary on the h8 d4 diagonal. After 22, queen e1, black again has some difficulties. It will make good exercise for you to verify this for yourself after either 22, queen takes d4, rook takes c3, or 22, c takes b2, queen e5. Next, we look at 21, queen takes d4. This is the move that Grandmaster Smyslov played, and it wins. The game continued, 22, queen h6, rook fd8, 23, bishop c1, bishop g7, 24, queen g5, queen f6, 25, queen g4, c2, 26, bishop e2, rook d4, 27, f4, and now rook d1 check, 28, bishop takes d1, queen d4 check. Black will make a new queen and retains a decisive attack. Notice the incredible strength of the black c pawn and the important role it played in this game. Now let's consider another example of the strength of declining the sacrifice, again in a game between two famous grandmasters of the past, one of whom would ultimately become world champion. Spassky Swetin, Russia, 1963. White to move on move 16. The player of the black pieces is a very strong Soviet grandmaster, Alexei Swetin. Playing the white pieces is grandmaster Boris Spassky, who would three years later challenge for the world championship and six years later earn the highest title. At first, it may seem as though black simply has a material advantage for nothing. Ho however, 
Grandmaster Spassky had foreseen that he would have the possibility of a very dangerous looking sacrifice, and in this position he played 16, knight takes f7. You are now playing black. What move would you play? Pause the VCR until you are ready to hear my answer. If you have not already done so, please consider these two moves. King takes f7 and castles kingside. First, King takes